Last week we were reminded that efficiency and profits were his business. He placed value on everything depending on how much money it might make him or how much money it might cost him. The ghost of Christmas past knew this and used it to open up Scrooge's eyes. As we saw, the ghost showed Scrooge a memory of a much happier time in life, a time when he worked with the most joyful and merry old man, Fezziwig. The scene was full of laughter and fun, and everyone appreciated what the old man had done in throwing together a magnificent party for his employees, something that many employers would not do. But the ghost was not impressed. A small matter to make these silly folks so full of gratitude. He has spent but a few pounds of your mortal money, three or four perhaps. Is that so much that he deserves this praise? And Scrooge, the man who put a money value on everything, had a moment of insight. It isn't that, spirit. He has the power to render us happy or unhappy, to make our service light or burdensome, a pleasure or a toil. The happiness he gives is quite as great as if it cost a fortune. It's in this early part of Dickens' A Christmas Carol that we begin to learn a little bit more about why Ebenezer Scrooge may have come to hate Christmas in time. It's clear that it's not feelings of warmth and joy that he's against. He doesn't have a problem proclaiming Christmas. He was quick to defend Fezziwig's kindness and his frivolity when the ghost challenged him. But all of Scrooge's life was not full of Fezziwig's joy. The ghost of Christmas past also reminded him that he had experienced the deepest of loneliness in his life, especially during the holidays. We never learn why Scrooge was left at the boarding school when everyone else went home to celebrate Christmas with their families. His sister, Fan, was able to convince their father to let Ebenezer come home just one Christmas. It was years later that that same sister, Fan, who was the only person who really had ever shown him any love, died early in her adulthood, bringing back that feeling of loneliness for Ebenezer. Bah humbug, indeed. And it's for those kinds of reasons that some of us fear the approach of the holidays, too. If a loved one has died near Christmas time, or if we have experienced some childhood experience that happened at Christmas time that caused us harm, we will remember it every time the radio starts playing a Christmas song, or the decorations go up in the stores or in our communities, and all of the loneliness and the sadness and the grief come flooding back. And that's what it means to live without peace. Too often we have a limited definition when it comes to peace. We tend to think of it as an absence of warfare or physical violence. But violence in many forms and emotional and mental trauma can be just as violent for us as physical trauma, sometimes even more so. That's why society has come to finally acknowledge the damage that bullying can cause. That's why the Me Too movement has blossomed and taken off with resonating with the victims of sexual abuse. That's why here in the church, we have to put even more effort into easing the pain of others, especially at Christmas time. Today's passage from the book of the prophet Isaiah describes the coming of a leader from the root of Jesse, which is fancy vocabulary for saying someone who descended from King David. The one who is coming will help to eliminate violence, to create a place where no one is harmed, no one is destroyed. 
But in bringing about this peaceable kingdom, this leader will judge the needy with righteousness and decide with equity for those who suffer in the land. It's precisely this prophecy of a leader who is to come that is so closely associated with Jesus, the one who was called the Prince of Peace. As Presbyterians, our denomination has spoken about this for a long time, and we have a response to how we are to respond to the Prince of Peace. The report that I'm referring to is called Peacemaking, a Believer's Calling. The report says, we know that peace cannot be achieved simply by ending the arms race unless there is economic and political justice in the human family. Peace is more than the absence of war, more than a precarious balance of powers. Peace is the intended order of the world with life abundant for all God's children. Peacemaking is the calling of the Christian church. For Christ is our peace, who has made us one through his body on the cross. How will peace be achieved? By disarmament? Certainly not. But not only by disarmament, by global economic reform? Certainly, but not only by global economic reform, by the change of political structures? Basically, at the heart. It is a matter of the way we see the world through the eyes of Christ. It is a matter of praying and yearning. It is an inner response to God who loves the whole world and whose spirit calls for and empowers the making of peace. The peacemaking work of Jesus the Christ takes place every day of the week. Every time one of us helps another person, Every time we, like Fezziwig, take the time to bring joy by throwing a party for employees who might not be able to experience that kind of celebration. Every time one of us contributes to someone who is in need, shares with the lonely, comforts someone who is grieving, we are answering our call as peacemakers. It's true that at Christmas time we do a better job of this than usual. The generosity of those who de donated to the Red Bag program filled three semi trucks and a fleet of vehicles with toys for foster children yesterday. We pray more fervently for peace to come to the world this time of year. Even if you go shopping in the stores, you will see signs and ornaments and other displays that express words like peace, joy, love. But every year after Christmas, there is a letdown. The bills come due for our Christmas spending. The parties are over, the bright lights and the decorations come down. The joyful music stops being heard. And the skies are often gray and cloudy. And the cold keeps us more isolated from one another. And it is so easy to get trapped in this gloomy place where we focus on the negative side of life. Ebenezer Scrooge had lived in such a place. He had focused on greed and feeling disdain for the disadvantaged. But as his eyes began to be opened by the first of the three spirits, he began to see the world through new eyes. The season of Advent invites us to begin to see the world through the eyes of Christ. It is indeed a time of praying and yearning, a time of preparing our inner response to God, who loves the world so much that he came into the world that we might know and believe, that we might become equipped to share the love and peace of Christ. And so that spirit is calling out to us, rise up and walk. No, you didn't get the joke. It's not that spirit. I needed Terry to stand up for me. 
Be that spirit. Now, the spirit that we are being called by is the spirit of Christ that calls us into this holy season and every day and empowers us to be peacemakers. And so as we go through this journey of Advent, may we open our hearts and open our eyes so that we might see the world through the eyes of Christ and that we might work with God for peace in every heart in every land. May it be so. Amen. As we bring our gifts, remember that the gifts are also a way of bringing peace into the world as we share and do the work of Christ through this community, in our community, and around the world. So bring your gifts. Be makers of peace.